kısa bir molanın ardından Selina Bieber web siteniz için hayati öneme sahip online security'den bahsedecek, online güvenlikten bahsedecek. Selina seni sahneye alabiliriz. <gülüyor> Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm really excited to be speaking English in Turkey. This is the first time I've been able to do an English presentation, normally I have to do Turkish, so I can get rid of the second language nerves. Um, I'm here to talk about security, online security and how it relates to businesses. Obviously I'm a bit talking about a different audience and a different topic because I, th I think all of you are from agencies, digital marketers, but at the end of the day, we are all stakeholders in this industry and it's important to understand the implications of online security for um, our own business and for our customers and clients. So for those of you, I'm sure everybody knows GoDaddy, so just a very, very super brief um, introduction. We're the world's largest, largest cloud pa platform dedicated to small independent ventures and we obviously provide businesses, entrepreneurs, and the like with tools to build and grow their online presence. And we work with web professionals and web agencies to support their own clients. We have 18 million customers globally, um, 77 million domains under management, and 8,000 employees. So what is the component of small business and going online? We are with majority of our customers at the beginning of their journey, whether it's through web agencies or web professionals, we start when they dip their toes into the internet and this can be a bit of a scary thing. So while we offer the tools to get online and grow online, we also have to educate our customers and your clients on how to operate with a little bit of caution. And the reason being is, when you go online, you build your online presence, this leads to visibility. Whether that is through being connected through a social media account, or whether that is because you, know, you are working on your SEO ranking, you become visible when you go online. And this leads to vulnerabilities, especially if you don't have much of an idea about online security. And this makes you a potential target. When we look at the internet of things, um, this provokes us even further to evaluate our approach to our own individual security. Today there are close to 25 billion devices and we've got a population of 7.8 billion people. So when we look at it, the number of devices is actually three times the global population. By 2025, Statista estimates that this will hit the 75 billion mark. This has huge implications. We, it's almost out of control in terms of the points of connection to the internet. When we look at it, the headlines, the media, security is a super hot topic. I'm sure you've all heard or read about you know, the data breaches, uh, the hacked accounts, and it's normally a trade-off between are we looking at profits or are we looking at the way a customer, a, a, a brand stores its customers' data and security. And as a response to this, we've seen the introduction of GDPR this year, and in Turkey we've got a, an equivalent of KV, KVKK. But what is our takeaway? So I've likened it to utilities. Internet is not as revolutionary as it once used to be. So just the way we pay our gas, electricity, maintenance, phone bill, we also pay for our internet connection. And this makes us a little bit lazy when it comes to the way we treat our responsibility towards being connected to the internet. You know, we look at our uh, electricity bills, we may try to turn off the lights to save electricity, but we also need to make sure that when we're talking about internet connectivity, we understand the responsibility that comes with it. And to take us back to the very basic level, if we look at an in, individual internet user, I've, I've purposely chosen the Wikipedia definition here because I think it speaks to everybody. What is a web threat? It's a threat that is executed over the World Wide Web and it utilizes HTTP or HTTPS protocols or may also use other protocols such as links in emails and instant messages um, or malware attachments. And the reason for this, what does it lead to? Why is it a threat? It's because these cyber criminals, they use these threats, these hacks and attacks to gain information that they can pot potentially make a profit off. And when we look at the convergence between the physical world and the online world, this becomes even more important because we have the internet of things on one side, we have artif um, artificial reality on the other side, and we can split this into sort of three different levels. At a consumer level, we're all connected. 
I was thinking of, you know, examples in my own life. Um, we've got a, a video cam for my son, and I connect through my mobile phone to see, you know, is he sleeping? How has he slept today? Is he eating? Is the nanny looking after him properly? And it's actually really scary to think that this may be the subject of a data breach. Um, at an enterprise level, we may see things like smart meeting rooms. We, I've, I have worked in a, in, a, in a company where we had smart printers, so I could actually print something from my mobile phone. Um, and at an industry level, obviously, we're looking at uh, ways that the internet and internet of things works to make processes more efficient. Um, for small businesses, again, I'm taking it back to the, the GoDaddy customer segment here, um, they operate on a high wire. For them, every customer counts, every click counts, so they can't compromise their customer integrity and the trust that they build with their customers. At the same time, because they're on a tight wire, the level of budget, the level of expenditure they can spend on security is limited, but even if they do make that investment, they have limited knowledge. So it falls on us to educate them and build awareness around you know, how, what are the best practices in online security. Now let's look at some of the data. I have two studies that I'm going to touch upon today. One is a um, GoDaddy study that took uh, 75,000 websites um, between 2017 and 2018, uh, and they were all treated because they were infected. They were a victim of some kind of attack. And there's also a micro small business um, study that we did in the US, and this was offered insights about attitudes towards online security. So out of, over six, out of the 65,000 sites that were compromised, over half of them had software that was outdated. And when we look at the core platforms, we see WordPress is obviously, I think it's the, the international norm. I'm sure everybody loves WordPress. It's, it's a great platform. Um, and then we also see Joomla and Magento as well in the, in the top three. Um, and it's all due to outdated software. When we look at the uh, compromise, the number of compromised files, we see that the average was 110, but it could go up to as many as 35,000 files. So depending what kind of data you store, it, it can have massive implications on the business of your client or on your own business as well. When we look at risk mitigation capacity, and this is a, a different study that was conducted with small to medium businesses in the US and UK, so it takes the sample size a little bit broader um, in terms of income and, and the size of the business, um, but we see that only one in five of small to medium-sized businesses consider their ability to mitigate cyber risks as highly effective. So there's an awareness that I can't really p mitigate an attack or the risk but at the same time, there's limited ability to go and do something about it because 50% or more have experienced a successful or unsuccessful ransomware attack. And 50% of these data breaches actually resulted from their own employees. So it's looking at how you structure your team or your client's team on the topic. You know, are they educated on security? But at the same time, what are the things that you need to have in place to if you are attacked, make sure that that at attack is un unsuccessful. And when we look at the real impact, so we've seen the numbers, but what is the cost of this? Again, when we look at the SMB segment from the Ponemon study, um, we see that one in 10 organizations report a loss of between one to $5 million, while one in six report a loss of between 100,000 to 500,000. GoDaddy's research on the micro small business segment resulted or found that one in eight micro-sized small businesses reported a loss of greater than $5,000 from a hack, and this for a, for a small business is significant. But I think what is more, even more interesting is these two quotes at the bottom. According to a KPMG study, 20%, um, so again, one in five shoppers, consumers, would stop shopping at a retailer after a breach, and 33%, so one in three, would take a break from shopping there for an extended period of time. So this impacts the business's ability to actually do business and gain revenue because it puts a stop in their business continuity. And this, this impacts, obviously, trust, reputation, but also business sustainability. Um, and when we look at the other side, as much as 60% of hacked businesses go out of business within six months in the small business category. This leads to everything because it's costly, you lose customers, and ultimately then it's really difficult to continue doing business. 
the paradox here is, when we look at the attitudes and response, there's a little bit of a disconnect. So when we asked um, micro-sized businesses what their greatest fear was or concern was concerning a hack, it was the compromise of um, bank or financial information and then customer data. But when we looked at their response, less than 50% reported changing their financial data after a breach. And 81%, while 81% it, it is arguably a good s score or percentage, um, only 80% reset their passwords. For me, I feel like this should be 100%, because if you've got even the inkling of a brink, the, the first thing you should do is change your password. The two limiting factors here are really expertise and budget. And this is something we talked about previously when we looked at you know, what, what is the, how do small businesses operate. So one in five sm very small businesses, they don't spend any money on website protection, so they're not protected. I think it's positive that almost 70% do invest in some kind of protected tools, but when we look at the amount, it's between one to $500. So the level of of tools they have, the level of security they have depends on what they have in place. Um, and at the same time, only 30% check their websites weekly. So it's not only getting the tools required to secure your business or your customer's business online, but it's also teaching them how to um, maintain their security best practices. And one of the things, or one of the steps in achieving this is knowing what you're up against. So what is the point of entry? We see that from the, the study, um, computer or hard drive was the primary uh, device, fi primary point of attack, and the website was the second one. So when we look at how to you know, mitigate attacks, we need to know which devices or which platforms are likely to be compromised. Um, and then looking at also how these are distributed. So Looking at the other Ponemon study, we can see that different types of malware was di distributed primarily through phishing, social engineering, insecure or, or spoofed websites, and again, social media and similar. So what they actually do is they integrate into the UX. So it's somebody with a limited level of knowledge. I mean, my dad, for example, he got a spam email that mentioned my brother's name and he clicked on it, and this was at the beginning of this year. So even in my own family, you can see these examples of if there is enough data that they can access to use a name or something that you're very familiar with. It's very smart. So this is, this is the awareness that we need to build. And let's also have a look at the threats a little bit. So we have Trojans. Um, I think everybody is aware of Trojans. I remember my first experience with a Trojan was probably 15 years ago, I was sitting at home talking on MSN and somebody decided to send me a link and I clicked on it because I was innocent and naive. Um, and all of a sudden my CD drive was being ejected and closed again. Um, and I freaked out because I had no idea what was going on and it was my first understanding of, well, there's some, there's, there are some people on the web that do have malicious intent. So these I mean, that was an innocent example. I shut down the computer and it was fixed the next day, but they can steal your bank account login details, um, backdoor Trojans, they give hackers admin access so they can control your computer or network, like this example. Um, key loggers, they are another type of malware that, that monitors the strokes on a keyboard or touch screen, so it can happen on mobile as well. And this allows hackers to, again, steal private information, whether it's passwords or whether it's you know, messages that are being communicated. Um, ransomware, we see this coming up a fair bit, especially when we talk about the small business segment, um, because that's where data is encrypted or put on ransom, and then the hackers, they require that that business pays a certain amount of money to get the data released. And you'd be surprised at the amount of business actually that do pay that ransom. Um, exploit kits is another kind. They provide criminals with upload options um, based on the vul vulnerabilities on the victim's machines. Bots, um, they can, they're sort of implanted on computers and then they help assist in other crimes. So it could be something like distributing spam or it could be something even more malicious like a DDoS attack. And then the advanced persistent threat category is an attack that is usually sophisticated and long running. And it's, it's really to monitor network acti activity and then steal 
classified data rather than interfere with the way a network or machine is running. So how were websites affected? Um, when we look at the most common types of uh, malware distribution, we can see backdoor, um, standard malware, but also spam SEO. And I think this is interesting because it's becoming a, a favorite and we're seeing it increase year over year. Um, and what it does is it chases away customers from your website and increases the, list, the, the risk of you being blacklisted. Um, and we've seen, according to Securi's website hacked report, between um, 2016-2017, there was a 7% year-on-year growth in specifically SEO spam. So let's take a look at it in a little bit more detail. Um, it distorts or can distort search engine results um, by redirecting sites. So this specific GoDaddy study, it took 10% of the websites that were fixed by GoDaddy, 10% of them had been blacklisted by search engines. And while 10% doesn't seem like a lot, when you look at a small business, so the small business numbers were 6,500. And that means that 6,500 businesses were actually invisible on search engines. And this can have a direct impact, or, or does have a direct impact on their ability to get found and therefore do business. Another interesting data point is when we look at the difference between search engines and security companies, we see that the security companies had a higher level of blacklisting versus Google. So while the overall blacklisting on search engines was lower, if we do see more alignment between security companies and search engines in the future, the occurrence of blacklisting may increase as well. And as we touched upon at the beginning, um, most, in most cases, when we look at the software, when we look at the platforms, the CMS platforms that we're talking about in these cyber um, crime cases, it's primarily due to the deployment configuration and the overall maintenance of the software or of the platform. So it comes down to the way we execute rather than the software itself. So what do the internet giants say? Mozilla, we can't afford to have a non-secure web anymore. We need to be focused on online security. And in order to do this, Mozilla is disabling per persistent access to visitors' webcams and microphones. So this means users will have to explicitly opt in to be able to use them every single time. Apple, it's a little bit different. It's obviously not a search engine. But when we look at Apple's efforts, it's to create a safe environment for both developers and for its consumers. So um, all in-app links, they require links to be HTTPS, so encrypted. And it's also been reported that Apple re will require all future updates and new apps to provide a link to the developer's privacy policy. So this is new, and this is again related to how data is stored and handled, and to give consumers a peace of mind. When we look at the latest update as well, we see that um, podcasts may be in the future forced or asked to have a SSL certificate on their feed it, to align with this HTTPS protocol as well. And Google, I think Google is the best example here, we all know it, but from a user perspective, they've made it in your face as part of the UX. And the reason for doing this is to build awareness in the user. So while this may be second nature to us, we know when a website is secured or not because we see the, the address bar, here, by actually having a pop-up there that shows you and tells you, no, this website is not secure or it's partially secure, a, a, an internet user may be diverted from, okay, I'm going to click through, no, I'm going to go back to my search results. And if your competitor or your client's competitor has a um, secure website, then they will get more clicks. And ultimately, this will serve to drop your rankings or your customer's client's rankings in Google search results. So. It's really, the message is clear we, you, from all of these players. We need to have a secure internet. Um, and when we look at that, that comes down to HTTPS protocols. And from our angle, what, what is the answer? You know, what is the solution here? And it, it comes down to sort of three buckets, awareness, tools, and configuration. So awareness, as I said, you know, we're all stakeholders in this industry. We need to educate, motivate, and activate our customers. So 
look first and foremost at your own security practices. What do you do within your team? And we do this as a, as a global organization as well. Um, what are the risks that you are facing? What are the risks that your customers are potentially facing? Focus on passwords. It's so easy, but it's so often overlooked. Um, and limit access. Create a list of your top 10 security practices. And if you can, share these with your clients as well. And get physical. So like I've said, control who you give access to. Don't give it to anybody who doesn't need it. Choose your hosting provider carefully. And review your security um, software and also your practices and regulations regularly. On the tools, obviously look at what your setting up with your customers and yourself. Do you have an SSL certificate? Is your website secure? Do you have website security? We offer website security by Securi, and within that it prevents, it does daily scans for malware. So having this kind of tool inbuilt protects or mitigates the chance of risk um, against these cyber attacks. And website backup. At the end of the day, if something does happen, having a clean copy of your website to deploy automatically will save a lot of time and effort. And on the configuration side, really it comes down to the way you execute on the CMS. Make sure that it is a, if you can, choose a, a managed CMS platform so the updates and the support and patching are done by your service provider. Um, ensure that your software is up to date. Minimize risks by having an established process to test and deploy. So it should be routine. Your entire team should be used to it. Um, use external tools to check for vulnerabilities. And use trusted, supported third-party plugins. Um, you'd be surprised at the amount of people I've come across that ask, you know, oh, can I add this plugin to my WordPress site, for example? And because it's blacklisted or it's not on the whitelist that GoDaddy has, we don't allow it. And that's to protect our customers. And on the other side, or linked to that, is disable any unnecessary functionality or features that you're not using because you're likely to overlook them and that might be a weak point that will facilitate an attack. And I just want to leave you with this sort of parting message. The upside for being a good online citizen is invaluable. The reason for this is let's, let's talk about driving a car. You drive a car, you get in, you put on your seatbelt. If you break the speed limit, you get a fine or you get demerit points. If you drink drive, you have the you know, potential to get your license suspended or even go to jail. Um, and it's, it's for the good of the entire traffic for everybody that's driving, that for everyone that's on the road, and even passengers and um, you know, people that are pedestrians that are walking. So the internet is the same thing. We get penalized by blacklisting, by you know, low rankings, if we are not a good internet citizen. So it's on our shoulders, it's our responsibility to execute properly, to educate our customers and build awareness around it and make the internet a safe place for everybody to, to play, basically. <laughs> Thank you very much.